Hello, this is Makai. Welcome back to Uki Tucker Show. I am hip hop. So, uh, um, how was it working with uh, with Ice Cube, man? Man, that's one of the, the peak experiences of my career, to be honest with you. Him and him, LL, and um, and Tupac. Yeah. You no, know, Cube was so complete, and you want to talk about a street entrepreneur? He is really the prototype, in my opinion. <laughs> Definitely. And you know, Ice Cube would come to the studio, and he would have all his lyrics already typed out in a folder, yeah. and um, so he would listen to beats and just look through the folder and have his rap ready. And if he was working on an album like, say, The Lynch Mob or Yo-Yo, he would come with their lyrics finished as well. Mm. So so he was just incredibly organized, and he made it look so easy. And I have no doubt that that's where I got, like, 80% of my whole inspiration from is just watching him operate and how how easy he made everything seem. Like, when we finished the song, like, Cube was the one doing the business deal with you. You know, he'd write the check in the studio, right? Um, balance the books, do all that stuff, and then... At the same time, he was writing the script for Fridays and producing that film, mm-hmm. acting in it, doing his album, and orchestrating uh, the albums for his, for his label releases. Definitely. So seeing that, man, it was like watching the machine, man. So I, I would look at him as almost like the perfect street entrepreneur. Wow. Well, we're going to go to break on that note, and then we're going to talk about a little bit more of uh, what uh, you've been doing in L.A. Uh, when we come back from the break. Soon as I get home Dear baby, it's me Getting stuck inside this max pen Trying to pay my debt for all my sins Please, it's been a century time Please, so heavy on my mind At times, it's like I'm living just to die I'm living in hell Stuck in my jail cell Stranded in the county jail Waiting for my chance to post bail I want to be paid In large stacks and mass and fast tracks I blast and wonder how long Hey Q Yo You remember that song? Yeah, man, that's crazy, because uh, the way that song came about is um, I brought a four-track loop. Uh-huh. That's how we do it uh, with Tupac. He worked so fast that if you didn't have your beat ready by the time he came in the studio, like if you actually brought your equipment and tried to tweak the beat while you're in the studio, he would give you five minutes, and if it wasn't ready, he'd bring in somebody else. Mm. So what happened is I brought that track in just as a rough, like a four-bar loop, and yeah. he laid his vocal over it, and I was going to take, take it home and fix it. Right. Somewhere in the mix, the master disappeared, and they never were able to find it. So what you're hearing is actually just him laying a rough over a four-bar four bar loop. Wow. So, how, Matter of fact, how did you... Uh, so you were working with Dre, you were working with Ice Cube once he left, mm-hmm. and then uh, what was the next move, and how did that go into you meeting with Tupac? Um... What happened was uh, I was working with Cube for a few years, mm-hmm. and um, my sister actually ended up hook, hooking up with, because um, me and Cube, we did like soundtracks together, remix albums, his albums, some of his acts, so we were doing a bunch of stuff, so I was predominantly working with him, and then my sister hooked up with Tupac, and I remember watching, uh, I think it was Rap City, mm-hmm. Tupac was premiering tracks from his album like a week after he got out of jail, and I was like, damn, and what I heard was just so incredible. Right. Um, that was that All Eyes on Me stuff? Uh, yep, exactly. Okay. okay. Played, uh, I forgot which songs. I think it was America's Most Wanted. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 based on what I heard, I knew I had to be on that album. And I called my sister and asked him which hotel he was staying at. Yeah. And I rode to the hotel. And, um, you know, speaking towards your entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, slid a tape under his door. And he hit me back the next day and he said, man, that's exactly what I was looking for. And I actually took two tracks off the album to make room for these. Oh, okay. Why do you think you're on the path you're on? I think it had a lot to do with my upbringing. Mm-hmm. Like I said, you know, I, I saw my mother um, a lot of times, and I think this probably is the same thing that drives a lot of other street entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. I saw my mother struggling a lot, you know, internally and externally, you know, mm-hmm. and um, you want to do something. And, uh, you know, when you see when you see your mother powerless, it makes you want to take pick up some of the slack. Yes. So I think that was a big driver for me was to make sure that, because we moved like every six, seven months. We were going from one apartment to the next. Mm-hmm. I went to like 16 schools before I even got to 10th grade. Yeah. So, you know, I got tired of it. And I was like, look, man, okay, I'm the man in the family now, and, and let me let me make sure that we're, we're going to be all right. Right, right. So that's, that's what drove me to a large degree, and I think it's probably in the genes for yeah. me to be competitive as well. Definitely. Yep. What, what does street entrepreneurialism mean to you? To me, it, it represents, like, for instance, you know, when I was growing up, my grades weren't great. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think some people in my neighborhood or in my school would consider me a, a somewhat of a troublemaker. And I think what, what, what hip-hop entrepreneurialism does is it gives you a second chance. Yes. You know, because, like, I might not have fit in in school and I may not have been in the internship program. Mm-hmm. But when breakdancing came around, I was number one. You know there what I mean? There you go, yeah. And then from there, it raised my self-esteem to want to do more with myself. So it took me off some of the negative things I was doing and put me on a more positive path. And I think that's what it does for a lot of other people as well, is it gives them a chance to prove themselves in an unconventional arena. You know what? Uh, um, what do you say to folks that uh, that say hip hop is a, a, a negative influence? Because it's going around now in the media, and you know hip hop has been under attack. What do you say to those people? I feel like a lot of aspects of hip hop, or some of them, you know, could look negative from the outside looking in. But I don't feel like it was the hip hop community that were the initiators of of these images, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. I think that there was some success, you know, like. Um, up until NWA came out, I think hip-hop was predominantly really a cultural movement. Right. And for a lot of us, it was a way to get away from negativity. You know what I mean? And that was the foundation of hip-hop was you can battle each other, you can still look street, you can still look hard, and you can still get girls, but you don't have to gangbang or do something stupid. Right. And that's the foundation of hip-hop, really, Zulu Nation and all those things, was to, to facilitate positive change through a street culture. And somewhere down the line, I think with the release of NWA... All of a sudden, I think labels realize that instead of nurturing somebody's career for a couple of years and building them up as a lyricist, all we have to do is have them, you know, spew negative images, and it's like an instant launch button. Right. And I think that made people a little bit lazy. And, you know, being that hip-hop culture came from the inner city, everybody is looking for revenue streams. So if they go to a label and they say, I'm an incredible rapper, and the label tells them, well, we'd rather have what NBA is doing because you'll sell more records Mm -hmm. it's likely that they're going to follow that message and do what they're told to do do they want to get paid they want to get paid you know yeah so I think when the labels give them direction they they pretty much listen yeah and I feel like that's been part of it because like if you went to the inner city community now and took a hundred kids just random kids I would bet you that more than half of them aren't even necessarily in the gangster rap right Definitely. You know, uh, we were talking about how you got involved with Tupac. Um, the You, you kind of made a transition in your career from, you know, the... Because uh, I know you, that you did some stuff with the uh, Will Smith show, right? And, yeah. And you did some... What, what kind of... Can you explain a little bit about that and how you kind of got from a transition from music into film? Well, you know, I've actually been doing it all along. The first... The gold record that I have was the soundtrack to a movie that I scored and did the song to. Oh, okay. Yeah, and... um. I would say I got that from my pops, just seeing being real versatile. Yeah. And um, so I was doing film scores and records from day one, actually. Gotcha. I remember and, the first score your, your your father did on Sanford and Son when I was a little kid. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. <laughs> yep. And the, the good thing about that, you know, in terms of entrepreneurialism is that I would say if anybody's a producer out there or a music, musician of any sort, mm-hmm. um, Scoring is like the best gig in the world because you get paid whether you have a hit record or not. Right. It takes a little while to get in the game, but once you do, say you end up on the Fresh Prince show, that show is syndicated around the world, and every time you see it, you're getting paid. Right. So it's, it's actually a really, really good job for producers to kind of take off some of the pressure of making a hit. So let me ask you, that opening song, that was you? Um, I did the end credit. Oh, okay. And then all the other music in between. Gotcha. Yeah, that was Jazzy Jeff. Okay. Yeah. You been a bit of menace to society. That's right. Yeah. So um, from the uh, the the uh, you know you've been doing it all, all along, but I know that uh, at some point in your career uh, you decided to start uh, your own uh, company, QD3 Entertainment. How did that come about? Um, you know, I was doing music, and then when Tupac passed away, I felt you know I was starting to get closer to thirty, mm-hmm. and I felt like um, I wanted to offer. You know, the audience that was listening to our music more. I wanted to put messages out there, but I wasn't a rapper. Right. I was like, how can I get... Because sometimes you might be in the studio with somebody like Ice Cube or LL or Mob Deep, and they say such good things that may not come out in, in regular media. Yeah. And I was like, how can I offer that side of hip-hop to people? And um, the whole idea of doing a, a documentary on Tupac to kind of solidify his legacy in a more positive light mm-hmm. came about, and... Um, that was it. I never looked back. What's the biggest misconception about Tupac? 
you know from you knowing him personally? I think that people saw him run up on the mic and um, and have his lyrics ready. So mm -hmm. I think they took that as it was all natural talent. So all the people that tried to be like him figured, well, I'm just as naturally talented as him. And I think the biggest misconception is that he was prepared in theory. This is Miles, and we're taking a break, and we'll be back with the